I took a much needed break but the kid is back what's good what's good in the youtube hood it's your girl luna nova and i am back with another video for you guys today again we were enjoying the rabbit hole of the folklore so we're going to continue to go down it today we are going to be getting into asian folklore now maybe this is something that i should have done at the beginning of the series but i kind of expected you all to be able to have a little bit of an attention span and education on your own but some of y'all are lazy, so I'm gonna go ahead and provide that for you. Because a lot of you guys were nasty in the comments and I had to block and delete you. Yes, I do block and I do delete comments. I am not above it. If you get nasty over here, I can get nastier. And for whatever reason, you guys decided to be a little nasty in the comments when it came to the Caribbean folklore and the way that I pronounced some of the names. And again, I am not above human criticism, but let's not be nasty about it. I am not Michelle Obama. I do not rise above the occasion. If you go low, I go to hell to meet Hades himself. So with that being said, I need you all to educate yourselves on the term folklore and what it actually means. Because something can be folklore and also be fact. Two things can be true at once. To alleviate any nasty comments on the way that I pronounce anything, I'm just going to leave the pronunciations out and leave it to the reference videos to pronounce them. But again, if they are pronounced wrong, please politely correct in the comments. But now that we've gotten that out of the way, keep it cute and keep it classy in the comments because otherwise you're going to get blocked and deleted, okay? Okay. So again, we are going to get into Asian folklore today. So of course we have been enjoying the music video by my lovely sis, Megan Thee Stallion, okay? Because I absolutely love her. And she definitely did the damn thing with that new video that she did. She definitely has been killing it with my mosh out here, okay? You guys have had me literally singing that song for the last... 72 hours and I don't know a damn word in English and that's okay. But this first Asian folklore story that we're going to get into, I have a feeling is inspiring the video for all of this. Now, like I said, that is just an opinion that I have. Please do not flood my comment section telling me, no, that's not where she got it from. Okay, okay. It's just my opinions. I'm allowed to have one. Either way it goes, I definitely enjoyed the video and enjoyed the song and I enjoyed the education learning about this folklore. If you know of any other Asian countries where this particular folklore story is mentioned outside of China or Asia, please leave it down in the comments. Again, I will be creating a map of the folklore creatures that I have currently gone over and that I will go over in the future. The folklore talks about a beautiful woman who shapeshifts into a serpent. Let's get into it. Have you ever heard of the Chinese urban legend of the white snake? It's a popular folklore tale that has been passed down through generations in Chinese culture. It tells the story of a powerful and benevolent snake spirit who transforms into a beautiful woman. The legend is set in Hangzhou, a city in eastern China. According to the tale, a white snake spirit, Bai Shu Zhen, and her snake companion, Zhao Qing, transform themselves into human form and come to the human world to experience life as mortals. Bai Zhu Zhen, the white snake, is depicted as gentle, kind-hearted, and virtuous. One day, she meets a young scholar named Zhu Zhen and falls in love with him. They marry and live happily together, running a herbal medicine shop. However, a Buddhist monk named Fahai discovers Bai's true identity and believes that spirit should not interfere with humans. Fahai considers the relationship between the human and spirit worlds to be improper and seeks to separate them. He tricks Zhu Zhen into drinking a magic wine that reveals Bai's true form as a snake. Frightened and betrayed, Zhu Zhen falls ill and is close to death. Bai is determined to save her husband's life and seeks help from a magical mountain spirit. With the spirit's assistance, she unleashes her power and causes a great flood to overcome the city, hoping to find the magical herb that can cure Zhu Zhen. Despite Fahai's attempts to stop her, Bai was able to retrieve the herb and save Zhu Zhen. Bai's love and dedication to Zhu Zhen touch the heavens, and she is granted a chance to redeem herself. She is transformed into a human once again and reunited with Zhu Zhen. The story ends with their joyful reunion and the couple living happily ever after. Next up, we're going to head over to Cambodia and discuss a certain celestial being known for their grace, dancing, and their talent in music. Now, if you've seen a certain episode of Love, Death, and Robots, you might get a certain reminder seeing this next reference video. Have you ever heard of the Cambodian legend of Apsaras? Apsara is a significant figure in Cambodian mythology and traditional performing arts. Derived from Hindu and Buddhist traditions, Apsaras are celestial beings or nymphs known for their extraordinary beauty, grace, and talent in dancing and music. In Khmer culture, Apsaras are depicted as elegant and ethereal female figures. They are portrayed with intricate headdresses, ornate jewelry, and flowing garments that represent their celestial nature. Apsaras are believed to inhabit the heavens, particularly the realm of Indra, the king of the gods. According to Cambodian mythology, 
Apsaras descend from the celestial realm to Earth on special occasions or during significant cultural or religious events. They are revered as divine dancers who entertain and enchant both gods and humans with their mesmerizing performances. In traditional Khmer classical dance, the Apsara dance is a key component. It is a highly refined and intricate dance form that embodies the graceful movements and gestures associated with the Apsaras. Apsara dance performances are characterized by delicate hand gestures, elaborate costumes, and rhythmic footwork. Through their dance, Apsaras depict stories from ancient epics and legends, bringing the mythical world to life. Apsaras are seen as symbols of beauty, creativity, and divine inspiration. They are associated with fertility, abundance, and prosperity. In Cambodian art and architecture, Apsara figures can be found adorning the walls of temples, particularly the iconic Angkor Wat temple complex. These intricate carvings immortalize the elegance and timeless allure of the Apsaras. The legend and presence of Apsaras in Cambodian culture highlight the deep influence of Hindu and Buddhist beliefs in the region. They represent the connection between the mortal and divine realms and serve as a source of inspiration and artistic expression. The Apsara's enchanting presence continues to captivate audiences and is celebrated as an integral part of Cambodia's rich cultural heritage. Next up, we are going to head over to Southeast Asia to talk about a certain shape-shifting witch who apparently is a beautiful person by day, but a very interesting floating head and organs by night. It amazes me how in a lot of different areas around the world, like in Mexico, for example, we have La Llorona. Well, in Asia, they have something called the Karase, an evil spirit from Southeast Asia folklore as a young, beautiful girl from the head up, but from the neck down, she is nothing but organs. She is a vicious creature driven by extreme hunger and thirst, active throughout the night until she must return to her body by daylight. And during the hours of daylight, she will wander among the local population as a normal human. The Karasu are believed to be demonic witches who become cursed and thus crave raw flesh and blood when neither blood nor raw flesh is available to them. The creature will resort to eating feces and other animal skeletons. These grotesque habits cause the Karase to spread many vile diseases to victims if they consume food or drink anything contaminated with Karase saliva or flesh hand. They will become Karase themselves and they are prone to stalking pregnant mothers so as to try to feed on or either their newly born infant or the placenta using a long tongue to either lap the placenta or even steal the fetus from the mother before it's even born. To prevent such evil acts, many locals, which and mostly in the Philippine area, they would put spiky plants around their homes, discouraging the Karase from staying close and shortly after birth, they would bury the placenta far from the village, believing that doing so would also deter the spirit from stalking the area. Karase could be often found in areas already haunted by the male spirit known as Kahang. If she were to be separated from her body when the sun rises, she would be doomed to a painful death. Likewise, if her body was destroyed, she would suffer a similar fate. She was also very weak to fire, and thus her most common enemy were angry locals with torches and machetes, who would pursue her and destroy her body while she also hunted at night. And the Karase can also emit ghostly lights, similar to those of the Will-O-Wisp and more modern depictions, often have her with large cannon fangs, also known in the western area vampires. And while this seems as a legend, there are records of Karase even in modern era and some have even made it to the local news, primarily in the Philippines. This has elevated the monster further into the realms of urban legends. Have you ever heard of this monster? Let me know if you have. Next up in the Asian folklore series, we are going to talk about a very popular folklore creature that I definitely know, but I did not know it by this name. We are going to head over to Japan and talk about a very well-known shape-shifting fox, also known as the nine-tailed fox. Again, this particular folklore creature is well-known throughout Asian folklore and has been referenced in many animes and movies and TV series. Kitsune's is one of the most common Asian folklore creatures. The Japanese version of Kitsune is regarded as a benevolent and cunning creature, like all foxes. They were known as Zenko the goddess Inari's messengers. Yako were malicious foxes and could harm human beings. 
According to some legends, they assumed the form of a beautiful woman and attempted to wed men from good families or even married for true love, being able to maintain human form for indefinite amounts of time. If one of these foxes reached the age of 100, it grew a second tail, and its magical abilities would reach a new level. After 1,000 years of life, the fox would become a Kyubi no Kitsune, the famous nine-tailed fox, reaching an almost godlike status. Kitsune Kitsune are fox spirits with magical abilities, often depicted with multiple tails, ranging from one to nine. The more tails a kitsune has, the older and wiser it is believed to be. Kitsune are often portrayed as having the ability to shapeshift, most commonly into human form. They can be male or female and are typically shown as being beautiful and alluring when in human form. Kitsune are significant figures in Japanese folklore, with numerous stories and legends about their interactions with humans. They are often associated with the Shinto deity Inari, who is the god of rice, fertility, and agriculture. Kitsune can be benevolent or malevolent, depending on the specific story. Some Kitsune serve as Inari's messengers and protectors of shrines, while others are tricksters that deceive and manipulate humans for their own amusement or gain. One famous story involves a Kitsune named Kuzunoha, who falls in love with a human man and marries him, concealing her true identity. When her secret is eventually revealed, she returns to her fox form and leaves her family, but not before teaching her son the magical arts. Now heading over to Korea, we are going to get into another shapeshifter. Side note, there are a lot of shapeshifters and reptile-like creatures that are known in Asian folklore. I kind of picked up on that when I was doing my research on all of these, and I don't know why I didn't connect the two sooner, but that's very interesting. If somebody could leave that down in the comments as to why, because I haven't quite figured that much out, I would love to know, because I'm curious at this point, what is it with Asians and reptiles. I understand them being very into spirits because I know culturally they believe in reincarnation. Well, a lot of Asian cultures believe in reincarnation. So I understand the correlation between spirits and or demons when it comes to Asian folklore. But what is it about reptiles? Leave it down in the comments, I'm curious. But I digress. A certain Korean folklore creature that is a shape-shifting goblin that is a trickster. Have you ever heard of the Korean urban legend of the Dokubi? Dokubi are supernatural creatures from Korean folklore. They are often depicted as mischievous and playful goblins or trickster spirits. Dokubi are known for their distinctive physical characteristics, such as their short stature, red or blue skin, long noses, and wide grins filled with sharp teeth. According to Korean folklore, Dokubi possesses extraordinary powers and abilities. They are said to have the ability to shapeshift, disappear at will, and control the elements. Some legends suggest that Dokubi can bring good fortune and prosperity, while others portray them as unpredictable beings who enjoy playing pranks on humans. Dokubi are often associated with specific objects, such as hats, canes, or magical items. These objects are believed to be the source of their power or symbolize their status as supernatural beings. In folklore, it is said that if a person is able to capture a Dokubi's hat or cane, they can gain control over the Dokubi or make a wish. Dokubi stories and legends are a popular part of Korean culture and have been passed down through generations. They are often featured in traditional folk tales, plays, and modern media, including books, movies, and television shows. The depiction of Dokubi can vary, ranging from mischievous and playful to more malevolent and sinister, depending on the specific story or adaptation. Going back to Japan, the next folklore creature that we're going to go over, it reminds me of the ring. And I say that for obvious reasons when you see this next reference video. This is a woman who is very tall in stature with very long black hair. And apparently she has some amazing abilities when it comes to using this hair, honey. Be careful. Japanese mythical beings you never knew existed. If you see a woman with long black hair walking alone at night, don't approach her. She could be a Harionago. Harionago roughly translates to needle girl. She gets her name from the thorn-like barbs at the ends of her hair, which she has direct control over. Of course, from afar, the average person won't know, and once you get too close, it's too late. When you approach, she'll smile at you, and if you return the grin, she'll go on the attack. Her hair will lash out at you at lightning speeds and rip into your flesh. She'll then rip you apart with her hair and then devour you. While no one can overpower a Harionago, you cannot run her. If you manage to hide in a place with strong doors and windows, you might be able to survive until morning when she'll disappear. 
That's all for today. Like for more content about Japanese mythical beings. Bye! Have you heard of the Chinese folklore about painted skin? Apparently this shape-shifting creature is someone who tries to emulate a beautiful woman by day, but turns into a grotesque creature at night. Going back to the 1740s, yes, the story is that old. This folklore is one of the most popular folklore stories that is throughout the Asian diaspora, but specifically scary story from the year 1740, and it's known as one of the most famous scary stories in China. It begins with a man who met a beautiful woman claiming she fled her home but wouldn't give him any more details. So the man let this woman stay with him and his wife but he was secretly having an affair with her. Then one morning when the man was at the marketplace, a priest came up to him and said he's been possessed by a demonic spirit. Thinking this must be a joke, he goes back home but finds all his doors were locked from the inside. So he decides to peek through the window and that's when he saw something terrifying. The woman he's been having an affair with was actually a shape-shifting creature with sharp teeth and a grotesque face. But the worst part is her skin was spread out next to her. Every day she'd wear the skin and paint on her facial features to appear human. And this is where the story gets a little weird. Eventually this woman finds out the man knew her secret so she rips his heart out. But that's not all. Because his wife went back to the priest who told her how to revive her cheating husband. He told her to go to this man who everyone in town thought was a little crazy because he was always talking about demons. And this man coughed up some phlegm and made her eat it. But later, at her husband's funeral, she started feeling sick. And when she threw it up, she saw that it was a human heart. So she placed it back into her husband's chest and his life was restored. Let me know if I should do more Asian urban legend stories and follow for more. Now this next reference clip is going to be from the Haunted City podcast. Shout out to my girl Luna. Hey twin. This folklore is well known throughout Muslim and Asian cultures. Apparently this low vibrational being, because I'm not going to call it the D word unless I'm going to tell it to get out. Y'all know me. <laughs> Apparently, this low vibrational being, when it is seen, it is seen in a very, very gross light, okay? It is something that is wrapped entirely in white cloth and only exposing the eyes and the mouth, and it is not in the most prettiest way. It's very creepy, if I do say so myself. When I first met Luna, she told me about this spirit called Pachong. Ooh. I know. Oh, Pachong, yeah. Yes. Ooh. Big fan of it. It's uh, very <laughs> creepy. Luna, would you like to explain? I know Luna hates this, but. I really hate it. Don't want to yeah. see it. Yeah, yeah. I, will, like, I can explain yeah. it. Yeah. My eyes are watering right now because I can feel it, actually. So Pachong in, um, Pachong actually is, um, so when you die, in Muslim, actually, in Muslim culture, when you die, um, you are covered with on um, like white cloth and cottons but in a version of pachong it's the same thing mm -hmm. except your face is red and your eyes and nose are bleeding it's very very scary and you don't want to see that guys because you will suffer a nightmare because i don't want to see that yeah. as well yeah even that concept of keeping a body around in the shroud mm -hmm. for a time before yeah. you know proper burials or, or or whatever ritual is going on um yeah. yeah. So my cousin actually, um, he's first the first time he saw like a spirit or a gent was actually a pachong. Oh no. Oh, he gosh. actually he was actually he told me he was like eight years old and he was walking around the house and he saw a pachong like standing in the house. He ran to my uncle, like my uncle, his dad. He ran to my uncle crying and my uncle just stared at him, Oh, it's just a pachong because my uncle is literally used to like seeing evil spirits and yeah. scary stuff. So at that point it's like, Oh, it's just pachong, you're fine. Yeah. Well, but it's scary. I I never want to see that in my life. Now heading over to the Philippines, we are going to get into some interesting shape-shifting creatures out there. And apparently they range in a plethora of different things. Now, as we discovered in the Caribbean folklore video, there's some interesting ways to escape or avoid these different folklore creatures if you are to come in contact with them or if you live in areas where they are known to be. And apparently garlic does the trick. Apparently the garlic works for a lot of different folklore creatures. So maybe you just need to keep some salt and garlic with you at all times. Those two things tend to keep the spooky things away. 
There are monsters living in the Philippines. These creatures are considered Oswan, an umbrella term that includes a number of evil shape-shifting creatures from Filipino folklore. As far back as the 16th century, Spanish colonists began to learn of these terrifying legends. They're often described as having vampire-like traits, but also include witches, shapeshifters, werebeasts, ghouls, and perhaps the most terrifying, the Mananangal, which does this with its body. But the good news is, if you find its well-hidden legs, you can put garlic or ash on them, and then all of your Mananangal problems are taken care of. Now, perhaps the most disturbing part of the Oswa is their duality of living as normal townsfolk during the day, but transforming into terrifying beasts with an insatiable hunger for blood at night. According to the legends, these things will exsanguinate pets and livestock with a proboscis-like tongue. And they particularly go after children and pregnant women to devour their unborn fetuses while they sleep. But the Aswang isn't just a tale to scare children, it's a profound part of Filipino culture, reflecting deep-seated fears and societal warnings. It's a reminder that evil can be both familiar and hidden, lurking beneath the surface of everyday life. But what do you think? Are these things real? Leave a comment and let me know what cryptid or legend you want to hear about next. Next up, we are going to be talking about an Indonesian and Malaysian spirit that is apparently a feminist. I see you, girl. Not really, though, but like, no offense. I'm just saying, I see you, though. This feminist spirit, and I love saying that because I think it is so hilarious because there are really folklore out here that are avenging women. Y'all better watch out. All y'all unfaithful and dirty men out there, y'all better be careful. Now I see why y'all say y'all don't mess with spiritual women because y'all think we all witches and shapeshifters. Stop being unfaithful. And maybe you wouldn't get caught up, but I digress. This spirit is known to haunt the living as well as possibly unaliving people. So again, be careful out there. The Pontianak, also known as the Kuntilanak, is a figure from Malaysian and Indonesian folklore known for her terrifying appearance, her ability to haunt the living, and even kill them. But what if I told you that the Pontianak actually has feminist origins? The story of the Pontianak begins with a young, beautiful and kind-hearted woman who was deeply in love with her husband. But tragedy struck when she got pregnant and died during childbirth, leaving her husband alone and heartbroken. Other tales suggest she died at the hands of a man. Unable to find peace, the woman's spirit becomes a ghost known as the Pontianak. But unlike other ghosts, the Pontianak is driven by a desire for justice and revenge. She haunts and kills men who mistreat women as a form of payback for all the wrongs she endured at the hands of men when she was still alive. So the next time you hear the story of the Pontianak, just remember that behind her terrifying appearance lies the powerful spirit of a woman fighting for her rights and the rights of all women. This next reference video is going to be from Aries Moon Jazz. And let me just say, girl, I absolutely love me some you. I love your page. She's definitely another great creator to get into if you are getting into folklore. She definitely goes over a lot of American folklore and she specifically went over some things that were happening to her personally. So make sure you go check out her TikTok. Now heading over to Thailand, we are going to talk about a woman who was unfortunately unalived and her spirit was trapped in the banana tree that she perished under. Now, apparently this spirit is another feminist spirit because apparently the folklore goes that she was unfortunately unalive by a man and that is why she tends to seek out men as her victims. So again, to all y'all men out there, be careful. There's a banana lady leading men to their unalivings in banana trees. Well, technically, she's a banana demon. She's believed to be the spirit of a woman who perished on a banana field. And for some reason, her spirit became tied to the banana groves. She's said to be extremely beautiful, a traditional Thai woman with very long dark hair, beautiful face, itty bitty waist. Apparently her voice is extremely beautiful and she's said to lure away many tourists. A lot of the tales in Thailand say she actually loves to go against men who are doing wrongs to their women. You know, sneaky men. Women often see her as a benevolent spirit but men, not so much. I guess it depends on who you ask. But if you're hanging out in Thailand, I would definitely stay away from the banana groves and the banana trees, unless there's lots of people around you. And as somebody who grew up with a grandmother from the jungles of Thailand, I would take this seriously when in Thailand.
I definitely enjoyed the education on this series. It was definitely something different for me. Some of these I have definitely seen just because of Hollywood and different TV series that I'm into. Obviously, y'all are here. Y'all know what I'm into. So <laughs> it was just interesting to see some of them and learn them by their proper names and see where they come from culturally. But this is something I definitely could see myself doing a part two because when I say there are so many different Asian folklore creatures and, and stories, honey, we might get up to part five with this one, but if that's something that y'all wanna see, definitely leave it down in the comments. As always, I have to include this in my videos. Y'all, please do not get scammed by scammers. There are only two ways to contact me, and that is either through my Etsy or my business email. If you do not contact me, and the keywords, if you do not contact me through one of the two, you just got scammed by a scammer. I will never reach out to you via DM. I've recently been going back on my TikTok and deleting all of my videos. Yes, you heard me deleting all of my videos because there are too many scammers that are just plucking them off of TikTok somehow, some way, even though I've turned my downloads off, but I digress. And they're just uploading them and scamming you guys out of your money, trying to recruit you guys for readings and products. And it is sickening. So again, if you did not contact me on my Etsy page or my business email, you just got scammed by a scammer. If you are looking for me for any products, any services, or just for a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time with me, please make sure that you book with me on my Etsy. But with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and get out of here because I have a lot more research to do because I have a feeling this is gonna wind up being a few parts. And again, if that's something that you guys wanna see, make sure to leave it down in the comments. But as always, drink your water, mind your business, and stay prayed up and protected. And as always, Luna loves you.